Welcome to the Red Roof Recovery Show, a program to soften the path of recovery from substance and behavior addictions. And you know what? It's not just about addictions at all. It's about life. I want to first thank Russell Allen Scott for writing this beautiful piece of music. I just love this. And it's called Greatest Bravery. It's such an appropriate theme song for this show because it has certainly taken a great deal of bravery for me to start publicly speaking about my addictions to drugs and alcohol. But like I said, this program is about far more than addictions. It's about life and the messiness of life, which includes mental health illnesses and disorders like addictions. My name is Tanya McIntyre, and I really appreciate you spending the next 30 minutes with me as I share the experience that I've acquired over the years through my own recovery from mental health disorders. I use a variety of tools and techniques that I'm gonna be sharing with you on each episode of the Red Roof Recovery Show, because there are literally hundreds of tools and techniques that you can use to manage life and recovery. The key is to keep looking until you find something that clicks for you. And then once you find whatever that is that is gonna resonate with you, you wanna grab onto that with both hands and keep doing more of it. One of the keys for me when it comes to managing mental health disorders like addictions is acceptance. So on this episode of the Red Roof Recovery Show, I will be exploring this, this idea of acceptance. And it's a deep uh, idea. And we tend to do that, dig a little deeper on uh, these 30 minute episodes. So I, I don't want to take away from the topic uh, but I also don't want to just kind of skim over the surface of it. So it's quite possible that you'll hear me talking about acceptance on more than one episode of the Red Roof Recovery Show because it's a deep topic. When dealing with life's adversities and general messiness, we can often get bogged down by lots of heightened emotions. No scarcity of those for sure. These emotions can range from anger, frustration, impatience, intolerance, hopelessness, all of which can lead to mental health disorders like depression, anxiety, and addictions. What I've learned in my recovery journey over the years is that I am not my addictions. And there were not many pills that were too hard for me to swallow during my drug days for sure, but accepting that I was not my addictions was definitely a hard pill to swallow for me especially because society's opinion of me and anyone who is challenged by mental health disorders like addiction is that we are flawed. Our character is defective. We are morally bankrupt. And let's face it, never any shortage of negative emotions that are gonna come with this thing called life. I've learned to separate my self-worth from the negative feelings that feed these countless unhelpful emotions. Our value as a human being is totally separate from our addictions, our behaviors. Our value, our self-worth is separate from everything and everyone around us. In order for me to maintain my motivation to live a sober and healthy life, I've had to learn to develop my self-worth and my value independent from outside circumstances, perceived realities, and society's opinions of me. And this has not been an easy task by any means, because we live in a culture that values achievements, specifically financial and professional achievements. And once we achieve that status, society then tells us that we will be happy as a result. And if we're not, well, then there's something wrong with us. Until, of course, we go out and buy something or take something to feel better. So how do we develop tools that can help us to develop our self-worth and our value outside of these circumstances, people's opinions, and social programming? Well, our Western culture at least teaches us that achievement is the key to that happy life. We're taught that life is a zero-sum game where the, there are winners and there are losers. The winners are happy, the losers are unhappy. And lots of research studies have shown that successful people are actually no happier than anyone else. And quite often, the stress that comes from maintaining that success causes a great deal of unhappiness. And more often than not, that state of unhappiness can lead to chronic diseases and mental health disorders like addictions. So I wanna take a deeper look at that social construct 
that has us believing that our life is a zero-sum game where there are winners and losers. Winners are happy, losers are unhappy. Do you think this is true, that winners are happy, losers are unhappy? No doubt, life is complicated. People are complicated. And there are no simple solutions for all of the complex problems that come with life. I just want to take a look at the history of our species for a moment, though, because we certainly didn't use that winner-loser philosophy in our successful development and evolution, did we? Our success as Homo sapiens was built on cooperation and something called altruism, the unselfish concern for the welfare of others. Hard to believe, I know. But we have lost that altruism, unfortunately, because we've evolved beyond our groups and our tribes. We're now living in a world of 8 billion people where there are countless groups and countless tribes all competing against each other. It's estimated that about 25% of the people who actually reach the top and have the success that our society defines as the ultimate achievement are actually psychopathic. Mm -hmm. And every corporation run by them is, by extension, psychopathic because they only deal with profit and growth. Profit and growth. Profit and growth. People are just secondary tools of that profit and growth. CEOs earn 300 times as much as the workers they so-called oversee. And when you crunch those numbers, the actual influence that a CEO has on the overall success of a corporation is quite minimal in most cases. So it's pretty hard to swallow the fact that a CEO can earn 300 times more than the workers. It's just not a, sustain a sustainable equation in any reality. I love to tell the story of Dan Price. Dan and his brother started a credit card company back in 2004. And they were inspired to do this after they witnessed the lack of competition among big credit card corporations that were charging excessive commission rates on sales that were being procured by small businesses. And even now I hear small businesses all the time saying it really costs us a lot of money to even accept credit cards because of these extravagant charges. So the company that was created by Dan and his brother was called Gravity. And they enjoyed successive growth over 10 years or so to a point where Dan, now the CEO, was earning over a million dollars a year. And then in 2014, he realized that a number of his workers were experiencing a great deal of stress because he was actually having conversations with his workers. There's a novel idea from any CEO. And in those conversations, he realized that many of his workers were dealing with a great deal of stress because they were not earning a living wage. So that was quite an aha moment for Dan, the CEO, thankfully. And he decided to reduce his million dollar income. He wanted to give his workers a minimum wage of $70,000 a year. And he also encouraged other entrepreneurs to do the same. Well, as you can imagine, that didn't go over very well in the business world. Everyone said he was crazy. He was called a socialist. Yikes. <laughs> Dan said that establishing a $70,000 minimum wage is a moral imperative. I absolutely love this guy. He says it's not a business strategy at all. And he continues to defend the wisdom behind that decision because it says, he says it not only helps his employees become better workers, happier workers, more productive workers, it also still helps his bottom line. There has been successive growth ever since he made this decision in 2014. And he says it's also this moral decision, this moral imperative that I felt it was important to make, an important statement to make in the corporate world, because it's going to help him achieve his long-term goal. And his long-term goal is to transform the business world. He says, I want to be, I want the scorecard rather, that we have as business leaders to not be about money, but rather about purpose, impact, and service. I want those to be the things that we judge ourselves on. So I love that, uh, that whole philosophy behind the company Galaxy with Dan Price as CEO. What a great example to the world. 
So if we take a look at the existing paradigm of that zero-sum game, if we assume that that is correct in our society, well, then we should also expect that big jackpot lottery winners should be laughing all the way to the bank, right? But in actual fact, studies have shown that that sudden acquisition of great wealth often creates more problems and more unhappiness for a lot of those so-called winners. The zero-sum expectations that our society imposes upon us can feed a multitude of unhealthy emotions and behaviors. We often attach our value and our self-worth to things like our appearance or our desirability as partners. And we get it everywhere, right? We're inundated with messages all the time telling us how we should look, how we should dress, how much we should weigh, what size our clothes should be. And especially in this era of social media and selfies, right? There's just constant pressure on looking good. Society dictates how we should look and how much we should weigh. We have created a multi-billion dollar diet industry. And it's an industry that doesn't work. Diets don't work. There is actually one diet that works. It's a digital diet. When you watch, read, and listen to positive things, you'll feel the joy that life can bring. <laughs> That's a good diet to have, a digital diet. But I think, and this is just my thought, that the diet industry is actually feeding the tens of millions of people who are afflicted with eating disorders. And that's my world, ideal in circles of recovery with people who are addicted to not just drugs and alcohol, they're addicted to food, they're addicted to the internet, they're addicted to sex, they're addicted to pornography, they're addicted to gambling. There are all kinds of addictions, mental health illnesses, mental health disorders. It's not just about alcohol and drugs. It's the messiness of life. So this tool of unconditional self-acceptance is something I'm very passionate about. Not just unconditional self-acceptance, but unconditional life acceptance and unconditional other acceptance. So those acceptance pieces have been huge in my recovery journey. And the unconditional self-acceptance teaches us that who we are is all that really matters. And it helps us to find some of those elemental truths about ourselves. So you need to answer that question. Who are you? Who am I? It's a pretty deep question, but I can tell you what you're not. You're not your job. You're not your bank account. You're not defined by how many people like you or even if anybody likes you. You're certainly not defined by the number you're seeing on the scale. People suffering with mental health disorders, like addictions, often feel judged. Now, we can't stop anyone from judging us or thinking about us in a certain way. It's totally out of our control. And there's a great tool that I use called the hula hoop metaphor, which reminds me of what's within my control and what's beyond my control. A lot of hula hoops make on the rounds in the world and we're crashing into each other all the time because we are trying to control that which we have no control over. Our only responsibility to ourselves is to do our best to truly believe that our best is good enough for us. And that's key because we're all different. What works for me in my recovery journey, what works for me to have a somewhat balanced and healthy life may not work for you or anybody else, but it works for me. And I kept looking in my recovery journey to find things that resonated with me, things that clicked with me, thinking, yeah, I can make this work. So I'm just here to share what's worked for me and to share what I'm learning in my journey of recovery. And you can take whatever tools you think might work and try them for yourself, but keep looking. Even when I'm doing the Zoom meetings now, it seems the whole world has migrated to Zoom meetings. So I do recovery meetings online with Zoom. And sometimes I get 15 people, sometimes I get 50, sometimes I get 150 people. And there's always the common element that it doesn't matter why we're there, what we're addicted to. We're there for peer support, to learn from each other, because what somebody shares may resonate with you. It may click with you. It may finally be that moment when you think, oh, wow, yeah, why didn't I think of that? So it's all about just keeping yourself out there, keeping your 
antennas up and just keep searching for what resonates with you because it's about you, your recovery, and your life. Dwelling on any other expectations, judgments, outside criteria is just a recipe for unhappiness and a threat to your health, both physical and mental health. You know, what I really wish is that we evolve to a place where we accept that our physical and our mental health are directly linked. So I've been managing my depression, my anxiety, my addictions by asking and answering some pretty tough questions each and every day. And I do it each and every day for a couple of reasons. Because it keeps me accountable and it keeps me reflecting on the fact that sometimes the answers will change from day to day because life changes from day to day. The only certainty of life is life's uncertainty. So the sooner I can adapt myself to life's adversities and learn how to swing with it and ride that wave of life, emotions, urges, and everything that goes with that in my recovery, then the better chance I have to live a healthy, balanced, sober life, whatever that looks like for me. Because what my life looks like for me is going to be different for what is working for you and what your life is going to, to look like for you. I always say on our recovery meetings that we're here to meet you where you are and help you get, you get to where you want to go because it's all about you. Because there are literally hundreds of tools and techniques you can use on your recovery journey. So you will often hear me talk about my other Bible. It's the Feeling Good book by Dr. David Burns. He's one of my favorite people, brilliant psychiatrist, and he's still involved with Stanford University, although he's long since retired. And he has a second book now called Feeling Great. I love the simplicity of that. So I highly recommend you check out his website, feelinggood.com. Listen to his podcasts. I just love this man and what he stands for and represents. So he's one of the pioneers who developed cognitive behavior therapy. Cognitive being thinking. So cognitive behavior therapy is just that. It's thinking therapy. We don't need to overcomplicate it more than that. It's questioning our thoughts and reframing the thoughts to be more helpful to us in life and recovery. So in the Feeling Great book, it's a big book, as opposed to the Feeling Great book, which is, was a little bit of an easier read. Uh, Dr. Burns has expanded on his 40 plus years of practice with the Feeling Great book. And he's actually taken CBT a step further, and he's developed something called TEAM therapy. So it's an acronym. The T is testing, because he said more often than not, uh, psychologists and psychiatrists and therapists in general they think they're doing a good job, but they're not testing themselves to see how the relationship is going between them and whoever they're working with. They just assume that they're doing well because they're following, they're ticking all the boxes of what they were taught to do in therapy. So it's, he said it wasn't uncommon to hear stories of therapists thinking that they were doing a good job with their patients and their patients would leave the appointment and commit suicide much to the shock and chagrin of the therapist saying, well, we were doing so well, I've got the notes and blah, blah, blah. So Dr. Burns said, we need a way to test ourselves to make sure that what we're doing is working with our patients. What a novel idea, right? So he came up with this team therapy. So it's testing both uh, where the patient is at the beginning of your session together and then where the patient is when they're ready to leave the session, whether or not you've accomplished the goals that you've set out to do together. The E is expressing empathy. How often have I heard people saying, I just want somebody to listen to me. I don't want opinions. I don't want advice. I just want somebody to sit there and listen to me with empathy. That's all we need is empathy. So he said, that's part of the therapy and it's huge. The next one is A, the A of team therapy, agenda setting, because like I said, there are hundreds of different techniques and tools that you can use in therapy and recovery journeys. You need to find what works and resonates with you. And then the E, the, the, e, the M in the team is method. So I just love how he has a step-by-step -step strategy to deal with. He said, in two hours, I can melt away most depression, anxiety, uh, mood disorders, you name it. 
He said, if I have two hours with somebody and I can melt away their outcome resistance to recovery, then more often than not, two hours will have people almost recovered from whatever they came to him for. The problem with the system now is that therapists don't have the time to do that with people. Listening to Dr. Gabor Maté, the Canadian doctor who spent 12 years on Vancouver's east side, that's considered one of the most densely populated, chronically addicted populations in North America, if not the world. And he worked with these people for 12 years and he said, you know, when you're dealing with um, insurance from government insurance, when you're seeing patients, it's like an assembly line. You only have so many minutes to spend with each patient. So when I have a five-year-old child coming in with asthma symptoms, I have, to, I have no choice but to just give them a puffer, which is a stress hormone. Imagine five-year-olds coming to doctors with asthma, which is directly linked to stress. And I don't have time to ask the five-year-old, why are you stressed? You're only five but they don't have time. So therein lies the problem. And then that five-year-old who's dealing with stress as a five-year-old <laughs> grows into an adult to more than likely be addicted to something or suffering with a chronic illness of some sort. So from the Feeling Great book, uh, can you tell how passionate I am about this stuff? I mean, all we need to do is to spend more time with people and give people some listening, some empathy and <laughs> Most of the world's problems, I think, would be solved. We can just wave that magic wand. So from the Feeling Great book, here are some thoughts about what is feeding our depression, anxiety, addictions, chronic illnesses, etc. We irrationally think that we need more external validators to be happy, more success, more love, more money, more prestige, more friendships, more meaningful work, more, more, more. Instead of just tolerating or improving situations, we think irrationally about ourselves, with should statements and labels causing anxiety and depression and non-acceptance. That's why I love the smart recovery philosophy, the self-management and recovery training that I'm so passionate about is that they discourage the use of labels. So I don't have to stand in a circle anymore and say, hi, I'm Tanya and I'm an alcoholic and an addict. I am not my addictions. I'm far more than my addictions and labels. To stop depression, we don't need to change our circumstances to get those validators. We need to stop thinking unhelpful thoughts about ourselves. We need to accept ourselves. But we resist stopping that irrational, unhelpful thinking about ourselves. And we stay depressed even when attempting to treat the depression, which is an outcome resistance, which can be melted away with the right therapy. Why do we resist? because we unconsciously think that the depression, the anxiety, the irrational thoughts are all expressions of our values and they have benefits because that's what society teaches us, that we need negative feelings, irrational thoughts to express values and get benefits. So how do we answer that question? Is it possible that depression and the resistance to depression aren't because there's something wrong with us, but maybe because there's something right with us? Hmm? What if we explored that aspect of psychology? So a lot to uh, sink in with this 30 minutes together. I, I really appreciate your patience in um, persevering through these thought processes with me. You are an integral part of my recovery journey. And I thank you so much for hanging out with me here every week on the Red Roof Recovery Show. I want you to remember to laugh a lot. It creates endorphins, which are great painkillers. Uh, our mind contains an amazing pharmacy of feel-good chemicals known as neurotransmitters. And these neurotransmitters change with our thoughts and our mood. And it all begins with the language that we're using. So when we keep positive words, they will feed positive thoughts. And then that combined will feed our positive emotions, feelings, and moods. And then all of that combined will relate to more positive behaviors. That's the plan. And a very simple and effective way to automatically activate our rest and restore nervous system and calm down our stress hormones. It's really easy. I do it quite often. We take a deep breath through your nose and relax the back of your throat when you're doing that. Hold it for a couple of seconds and then slowly exhale through your nose. I know a lot of techniques say, 
in through your nose, out through your mouth. But this one specifically is in through your nose, hold a couple of seconds, slowly out through your nose. And repeat that a few times during the day. I start my day that way. And I absolutely think it works for me. So try it. See if it works for you, because this is all about you, your life, your recovery. I've authored a couple of books. Both of them are available on Amazon.ca. And the CA is different than the .com. So it's Amazon.ca. And I'm also thrilled that Finchers in the Square in Canada's prettiest town here in Godrich, Ontario, is also um, have, has them available for sale. I'm grateful for that. The first book is called Mindful Wisdom from My Philosopher Dad. It's a tribute to my father. My dad raised me as a single father in the 60s while he was struggling with his own addictions. And my second book is called Daily Wisdom from My Philosopher Dad. It's more of a daily journal and it comes with an inspirational message every day. And those inspirational messages, most of them came from my dad, but they also came from my own life experiences and also from a lot of the mentors I've had over the years. Uh, mentorship has been huge in my path of recovery. And they come from you know, different ideas, uh, seminars I've attended, workshops, all of these different ideas. I think of things, well, what inspires me throughout the day? I do take the time to reflect on a written word every day. And this, this, that's why I was so passionate about setting it up as a daily journal, because I can reflect on that inspirational message every day. So my hope is that you not only buy my both books, that, but that you will also take that daily wisdom journal book and contemplate that message. Take a few minutes every day, contemplate the message in the wisdom book, and then write your thoughts and your intentions for the day. I have found that the power of words is very powerful. That's why I encourage everyone to talk to yourself like you talk to your best friends. You know, when you're formulating your sentences, try to make them as positive as possible because those positive words will translate into positive thoughts. The positive thoughts translate into more positive moods, feelings, emotions, all those fun things. And then all of that combined will translate into more positive behaviors. So I do find the power of words very powerful, has been for me. The power of the written word is magical and sometimes even life transformational, certainly has been for me. My wish for you is to always live fully, laugh often, Get those endorphins going. Love always. Stay mindful. Be positive. Remember, there is great power in knowing that the only thing we can control in our lives is ourselves. Remember, talk to yourself like you talk to your best friend. May the force be with you. And remember, you are the force.